Good morning. It is good to see all of you, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord in his sanctuary. And thank you for the wonderful music, the children's story, the rest of our services. And as we begin again today, we want to just say praise God for camp meeting, spending time together. Our theme, as you know, is salvation simplified, and today is the 15th of August. The 15th of August, 2024, 180 years since that pivotal year, 1844. We've been looking back, reflecting on that throughout our series here, looking at how God has blessed and has led. And today, in the mornings, by the way, by now you know, the mornings we try to have a more basic Bible story. In the evenings, we've been looking back more historically and theologically what I call night school. And so this morning, once again, we're going to spend time in the Word of God. The title for this morning is, read with me, God's Grace for the Human Race. God's Grace for the Human Race. And just a reflection, going back again, historically you remember that Baptist farmer turned preacher, William Miller, and of course we mentioned before in the evenings we've been focusing on history, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans, Anglicans, Episcopalians, Congregationalists, and Disciples of Christ gave intensive study to the prophecy of Daniel 8. This comes from the book called Seventh-day Adventist Belief, page 363. They were looking primarily at one passage in the context of prophecy, that's Daniel 8, verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, as we look back, we realize that they had thought that the sanctuary was planet Earth. They were looking, studying the Bible. And in the middle of August, which is where we are right now in time, we're in the middle of August, August 15, there was a gentleman who was a Millerite, his name was Samuel Snow, and after careful biblical and historical investigation, Samuel, or S.S. Snow's study showed that October 22, 1844, as the exact date of this cleansing, the Millerites concluded this in mid-August with less than 10 weeks to go before October 22, 1844. And the appeal went out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, time is short, get ready, get ready, and words fail to capture the urgency and excitement that engaged those Millerite Advent believers in the time before October 22. Crops were left unharvested, shops were closed, workers resigned their posts. Nothing was important except their belief that Jesus would be returning in a short time. And I want to ask us here, as Seventh-day Adventists, are we as excited as those people were? Now, we know they had the wrong event, but are you and I as excited? Because they looked at this issue. People needed to be warned. Sins had to be confessed. Debts repaid. They wanted to be ready for Jesus' second coming. Are you as excited as they are? Are you wanting to get people ready? Sins confessed. Debts repaid. People need to be what? People need to be what? To be warned. Yes, we know they looked forward to the coming of Jesus. October 22, 1844 was that pivotal date with great expectation but also great disappointment. And as we look back, we know that they had the right date but they misunderstood the event. What was the right event? It was the cleansing the sanctuary in heaven was the focus. And of course, we've learned that as we've looked back. We know now that they had made a mistake as to the event. Today, we're going to reflect a little bit on a Bible story. But before we get that, a quick reminder. Over the last few days, we've been putting before you this challenge. The challenge is essentially know the roots and grow the fruits. So we've been looking in the historical reflection on 1844, which we realized was the sanctuary in heaven, and the focus is on Jesus. Then we looked at 1840, four years before, which provided the support, the prophetic support for 1844. Then we looked at 1844 and the scriptures where the focus is on Jesus. Then we looked at 1844, which they thought was the second coming, but we now know was the, not that event, 
But we studied the issue of the second coming, contrasting it with the incorrect idea of the rapture theory. And of course, our last time we talked together was 1843, the year before, when some of those early Millerites began to understand stewardship, where the focus is on returning faithfully to Jesus 10%, as well as providing offerings, giving of our offerings with a cheerful heart. Again, thank you for that story, uh, Evangelist Mudala, helping us to remember that this is what we must do. Our focus is always on Jesus. Because of his grace for us, we want to return the tithe, and by his grace, we want to give freely, joyfully, cheerfully of the offerings that the Lord has blessed us with. And in that context, I've been encouraging you as we've been looking back 180 years, there's one phrase I've been urging you to memorize. Say it with me. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. It comes from Life Sketches, page 196, paragraph 2. And in the mornings, we've been taking time to go into the Word, into the Bible, and that's what we're going to do again today. We're going to spend some time looking at an interesting Bible story. Now, some of you may say, oh, Pastor, I know that story, but do you really know it? We're going to try to find more treasures in the Word of God because God's Word is rich and helps us to understand how to live for Jesus better every day. Now, this story that we're going to look at is an unusual story. It's an unusual book. So I'm going to see if you perhaps can guess what book I'm thinking about as we consider going to this book in which, listen carefully, there are no miracles in this book, no supernatural visits, no prophecies. Hmm. Now, in the previous book, in the previous book, the book before the one we're going to look at, there was cruelty. In this book, there is courtesy. In the previous book, there is villainy. In this book, there's virtue. In the previous book, there's disloyalty. In this one, there's devotion. In the previous book, there's lust. In this book, there's love. Which book do you think I am thinking of today? Hmm. Contrasting, we're not going to look at the previous book. We're going to look at this book. I wonder if anybody can guess. It's a difficult question. We're going to spend some time in the book of Ruth. But before we get there, I want to contrast briefly the book of Esther and the book of Ruth. Listen carefully. These are the only two books in the entire Bible named for women. Yes, the book of Esther is about an Israelite woman in a foreign land. On, by contrast, the book of Ruth is about a foreign woman in the land of Israel. Isn't that interesting? The only two books named for women. Contrasting, fascinating. Now, today, we're going to reflect on a story from the book of Ruth. This is the way the book begins. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Notice the time identifier. When? In the days when the judges ruled. Think about that. And now when you see a time identifier in the New, in the New or in the Old Testament, you have to think, when was this happening? To give you the background, to give you the context. For example, if I ask you the question, where were you, where were you, when... Or where were you on Tuesday, the 11th of September, 2001? Now, I know this was what happened in the United States, but many people around the world were aware of that, especially since there were foreigners who were involved, who got killed as a result when those airplanes hit the Twin Towers. Now, if you ask me, do you know, Pastor Dupre, where you were? Absolutely. My wife and I will never forget. Guess where we were? That very day, Linda and I were actually on our way back. We had just completed four years of mission service down in Zimbabwe, where we had served. And on our way back to the United States, we had decided to stop in the country of Egypt. We wanted to go visit the traditional site of Mount Sinai. And as we arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai, believe it or not, somebody came running up to us and said, have you seen what has happened? Where? 
And we thought this man was just trying to get us to go with his taxi so he could get a, a, a taxi person. Oh, come, come, come with me. And we were, what, what do you mean? He said, come look, come look. There it is. And they took us to a television set in, where it was in Arabic, but we could read the English subtitles on CNN and we found out it was the attack. We were in Egypt. We'll never forget where we were. But if we ask you here in Kenya, where were you on Sabbath, the 21st of September 2013. Do you remember where you were? What happened that day? You know exactly what happened. That's right. Do you remember where you were when, they, when, you, when you eventually heard the news? I hope that you were all in church on Sabbath. Are you with me? And you heard the news later on. I see you smiling, right? <laughs> this is where you should have been. <laughs> you shouldn't have been somewhere else. <laughs> okay. So, so when you hear a phrase, such as, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. That's the beginning of Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, okay? You have to ask yourself, what was it like back then? What was it like during the time of the judges? And the Bible says in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was what? Right in his own eyes. That's the time of the judges. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. In other words, everyone went their own way. So think of the context as you start the book of Ruth. Are you following me? The context is that people were, were they obedient to God or were they disobedient? What were they? Disobedient. They were not listening to the Lord. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now stop and think about this. What land was it? Why a famine in the promised land? Remember God had taken the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. He took them to the land flowing with what? With milk and honey. How come there was a famine in the land of milk and honey? Let's open our Bibles and go to Leviticus chapter 26. Let's see what the Bible tells us. Leviticus chapter 26. This is the time when Moses was taking those Israelites on their way towards the promised land. And in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 3 and 4, it reads as follows. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. If, notice the word, if, you walk in my statutes, God speaking, and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Now you can read the rest of it later on, but let's skip down to verse 14. But, but, if you do not obey me, says the Lord, and do not observe all these commandments. And the verses continue. Then he says, verse 20, your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. So what do you think is the reason? Why was there a famine in the land? The famine was due to disobedience. Think about that. God had promised them he would provide for them if they were obedient. So let's go back to the book of Ruth. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a what? Famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. Now stop right there. You see, this is one of the reasons they send us pastors to go to school, to learn a little more extra, to give you a little extra insight. Because sometimes, as you know, in the uh, Kiswahili, or in English, or in French, or in German, or in whatever language it may be, there are what we call a play on words, a pun. The English word is paranomasia. Those English majors will tell us. A play on words. And here is a play on words. The word Beth, Beth, as many of you know, means house. Beth El means house of God. And here it says, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Beth, Beth Lechem. What does that mean? Beth is house, Lechem means bread. It's an interesting play on words. There was a famine in the house of bread. Are you with me? <laughs> there should have been bread in Beth Lechem, the house of bread. He was living in a town called House of Bread, but there was a famine right throughout the land. 
And so this man from the house of bread, where there was no more bread, are you following me? Interesting play on words there, right? He went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Curiously, famine at the house of bread? Why? Because they'd been disobedient. So they packed up and they moved. They trekked all the way. Well, how far was it, Pastor, you may say? Let's look at the map. Yes, they went from Bethlehem, oh, up around, all the way down to Moab. Now, why would they go to where? To dwell in the country of Moab? Why did they go there? What were they doing? Why did they go, notice, to the country of Moab? Notice the emphasis. Have we, had they forgotten? There's so much we can tell you about that. You can read about it in the book of Judges. You remember King Balak, Balak, the book of Judges tells us he tried to curse Israel. Remember that? Where was he from? From Moab. Don't forget the Moabite women who seduced Israelite men. Don't forget that the Moabites had been excluded for centuries from being part of Israel. Don't forget that Moab had oppressed Israel. Judges chapter 3. Wait a minute. What was this man and his family doing? There was the danger that they were going to do what? They were joining the enemy. Wow. Have you thought of that? So as we are digging into the book of Ruth, we want to think a bit deeper, to consider a bit broader the picture were they being obedient or not? Question, what should Elimelech have done? So let's go to our Bibles. Let's consider that. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Remember, there was a famine in the land of bread, all right? And the house of bread, there was a famine. And God had said, if you are obedient, I will provide for you. If you're disobedient, I will do what? You will, your fruit trees will not produce. You will have problems. Let's go and see what he should have done. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 2. Let's begin. And notice, you can read verse 1. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you do what? Return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, if you return, let's skip down to verse 8. You can read all the rest later on. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. And verse 10, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law, and if you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So think about this. Instead of packing up and taking his family down to Moab, what should have, he should have done what? He should have urged a repentance, a return of Israel to faithfulness to God. That's what Elimelech should have done. But remember the story says, in the days when the, the judges ruled. Don't forget that. So what did he do to, what did Elimelech do? Ah, sadly, he chose to go his own way. Now, you know what's interesting? This is one of the things I love about when I ask people, what's your name? In the United States, often names are, people give their children names after famous people after movie stars, sometimes after Bible characters. But what I love about Africa, often children are given names that have important meaning. Of course, in Zimbabwe, you will find the word, the name innocent used quite a bit. I met this little girl the other day. Her name was Treasure. Names that have beautiful meaning. So think about the name Elimelech. What does it mean? It means my God is king. Eli means my God. El, God. Eli, my God. Melech means king. Huh, interesting. 
So if his name is Eli Melech, Elimelech, my God is king, the curious thing is it seems to me, doesn't it seem to you, that this man whose name, my God is king, had forgotten God. <laughs> Instead of returning to God, he took his family to go spend time to live with the enemy. There's an interesting story I heard a few years ago, a few decades ago, when I was, had the opportunity to go and teach and train pastors in the country of Russia shortly after communism had collapsed. One of the pastors made a confession. And here's the confession by this pastor. But let me first start telling the story. See, I was teaching a class there, two classes actually, and, and, and as I got to the second course, one pastor made a confession in front of the rest of the pastors. There were about 60 pastors there. And he said, he told the story, confessing. He said, you see, we as pastors here in, Ru in Russia, we have tried to get Bibles into our communist country. Now, during communism, we were not allowed to bring Bibles in. Not allowed. No Bibles were allowed into the country. They were blocked by the communists. So what did we do? This is what he was, he was telling the story. He said, we used deceptive methodologies. Deception. We use deception to bring in the word of truth. <laughs> Think about the contrast. We deceived the Russian authorities to bring the truth in. Strange, isn't it? And so he was telling his story, and at the end of the story he said this. If only we had done God's work, how? In God's way. If only we had done God's work, in God's way. We should have used truthful ways to bring the truth in. We shouldn't have used the devil's methodology to bring God's word in. Are you following? He said we were doing it the wrong way. So here is the same kind of case. The man whose name is my God is king. His name is my God is king, but he was not doing it in God's way. That's the challenge. So let's pick up the story and remind you. You know the rest of it. We're going to touch on it very quickly. Ruth chapter 1, verse 3, after they'd gone down to Moab, the husband of Naomi, Elimelech, dies. Ruth chapter 1, verse 4, the sons, the Bible says, took, they take Moabite wives. It's a very interesting word, but again, this is why pastors go to study Hebrew and Greek. In the Hebrew language, that word take, is used for, it's not the normal word for got married to. Are you with me? It, it's kind of used for illegitimate marriages. Illegitimate, non-biblical. And it's used for the phrase of capture. But it's, it's not the right word for get married. It's not the normal word to get married. Why do you think that is being done here? Were the Israelites supposed to marry Moabites? No, they were supposed to marry within the faithful within the same group, within the people who believed in God. So here's a hint in the text. They took, they were going against God's will. Ruth chapter 1 verse 5, both sons die and they die without any children. Oh, very sad. In other words, multiple tragedies were the result of a wrong action by the head of the family. And by the way, that sometimes happens. Mistake, error, sin, sometimes over and we reap the results. But, but, the next verse says, read it with me, everybody. The Lord had visited his people by what? Giving them bread. Think about that. They came from the house of bread. <laughs> they moved to Moab. They went to live with the enemy. And because of their bad choices, multiple tragedies happened. And what does the Bible say? The Lord did what? Visited his people by giving Bread. Ah, the name of the town where they came from was Bethlehem, the house of bread. In other words, God reveals his grace for whom? For backsliders who made deadly decisions. Is, don't we serve a mighty God? Don't we serve a mighty God? Yes, we do. We do. We serve a wonderful God, a gracious God, a God who forgives. So now let's go back to our Bibles. Let's read Ruth chapter 1. Verse 8 through 10 and chapter 12 and chapter 1, verses 12 
and 13. So let's go to that little book we've been looking at here. We've been reflecting on a few passages, and now I will open the word. Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Read as follows from the New King James Version. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband, meaning a future husband, all right? So they kissed. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Go down to verse 12. Turn back, my daughters, Naomi said. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you refrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me, Naomi says, very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, what did she just say? Notice the last part of verse 13. Notice what Naomi says. It's on the screen. She says, For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, wait a minute, Naomi. I find it curious. Is it not curious how people often blame God for the results of personal choices? For example, you find a man or a woman who has smoked cigarettes for decades. They get lung cancer, and then they say, Oh, God is punishing me. God is angry at me. Wait a minute. You chose to smoke cigarettes. Or, you know, it's interesting how people, and so I have a question to you and to myself. Do I blame God when I mess up? Interesting how we love to blame God for our own choices, huh? Oh, we are human beings, just like Naomi. <laughs> She's blaming God when her husband should have made a better choice. They should have decided to rather call for repentance. Instead, they packed up and they went to go move and live with the enemy and made multiple wrong choices. They paid for that. So anyway, as the artist's impression here, they started going on their way. And as the Bible says, verse 14, the first part, they, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. They're on their way. And of course, you know the story how an Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth did what? She clung to her and she said, look, this is Naomi. Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And what did Ruth do? But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Read with me now, everybody. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. There it is. Ruth's important statement. Your God, my God. And so, and when she, Naomi, saw that she, Ruth, was determined to go with the, her, she stopped speaking to her. And so they carried on, on their way now, back to Bethlehem, which was called the house of bread. And so they arrived in Bethlehem. I love the artist's impression of Ruth on the right-hand side. Young, and look at Naomi. She looks like an old woman who is not happy, right? <laughs> you can see them arriving now in Bethlehem. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited. Now, stop there. There's another Hebrew word here that's, that goes this way. The word is whom. Uh, you hear the sound? Whom. It's the way you hear like, it's, it's an, like we talk about in English, the buzzing of the bees. This is a word that gives you the concept of the feeling. It's like everybody was talking because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Uh, they almost didn't recognize her. She looked so different. And what does she say? She says, 
But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Call me what? Mara. It means what? Bitter. Call me bitter. Now why is she saying that? Interesting. Listen to what Naomi continues. This, she continues speaking. She says this, the Almighty has brought great bitterness to me. I was full when I left, but the, law, the Lord has caused me to return, how? Empty. Now, now think about that. If you were Ruth, who's standing next to you, huh? who has chosen to give up her family, to give up her faith, to go to, with Naomi to a foreign land, to a foreign people, and, 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 and how would you feel if you were Naomi? And, and you hear your mother-in-law just say, the Lord I was full when I left, but the Lord has caused me to, to return. How? Empty. Huh? What would you feel like, Ruth? You, you, would you be happy? You, your mother-in-law is saying, you are worthless. In fact, I call this the most, listen carefully, this is the most ruthless statement in the Bible. You understand, right? The most ruthless statement. The mother-in-law says, I came back empty. Would you not think like Ruth? What about me, mom? <laughs> Am I useless? Am I worthless? Oh, but you see, Ruth understood. Naomi was talking about her husband and her two sons. Naomi is complaining. She continues. But why, why should you call me Naomi, pleasant, when the Lord has opposed me? Notice, she's talking about the Lord. Okay? The Lord. She is complaining. All right, and she ends up saying, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Notice it's an A-B-B-A -B -B -A pattern. It's like, an, like a poem. It's poetic anger against God. Ruth chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. She is complaining about this. Now, wait a minute. This is a strange comment. Ruth had just said, I want to serve your God. Naomi says, God is terrible. <laughs> what is Naomi? What's happening here? Ruth is she going to pack up and leave? Here is her mother-in-law saying, God is terrible. What do we make of Naomi's anger against God? Wow. Naomi is speaking out of her deep grieving. You see, Naomi perceived God as omnipotent, but as one without any real compassion. She had forgotten what we now know very clearly, as, as stated so nicely in the Bible, who is the one who causes evil? Who is the one? You're not answering me. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Who is the one who is the cause of all our grief? Revelation chapter 12, and then to 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon who was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 tells us again, just reminding you, First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 reads as follows, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So who is the cause of all our troubles? The devil, not God. You see, Naomi saw God as sovereign without grace, forgetting that though she came back empty, so-called, Ruth, listen carefully, Ruth had seen enough of, of Naomi's God through her to want to follow the Lord. But the story is not over, not just yet. You see, I want us to think about this because all of us, we're human beings. We all make mistakes. We all fail now and then, as Naomi was failing right now, as we see in the story. But, but you see, there's a thing that's called the impact of a consistent Christian life. Now, I'm going to read to you in your hearing a fantastic statement that gives hope to all Christians here it is. One Christian in the midst of unbelievers, like Naomi in Moab, may in the providence of God be like the piece of leaven, meaning yeast 
hid in three measures of meal, that is to do its work until the whole mass is leavened. Listen carefully. A what? Consistent Christian life will accomplish more good than could be accomplished by many sermons. In other words, you, friends, if you live a consistent life, you can, by God's grace, accomplish more than could be accomplished by many sermons by pastors or preachers or elders. Simply living for the Lord. By the way, you're wondering what LP stands for? That's the abbreviation for a book called Sketches from the Life of Paul. It's not a commonly known book. Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 299, paragraph 2, written by none other than Ellen G. White. So think about that, a consistent Christian life. How is the character revealed? How is my character, your character revealed? Listen carefully. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact. The character is revealed not by occasional deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and actions. This comes from a book called Steps to Christ, page 57, paragraph 2. Now, think about Naomi for a moment, okay? Here she was blurting out her anger against God. This appears to be an occasional misdeed. Are you following? But what is the important thing? Is the character is revealed not by the occasional uh, sorry, it, not by occasional deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency, are you following now? The tendency of the habitual words and acts. I love the way Paul the Apostle puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. I'll read it in your hearing. It goes as follows. You, Paul says, are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. People watch you, people watch me to see what is happening in our habits. Are we in a general habitual way through our words and actions revealing the character of Christ? Not, it's, the issue is not a mistake, an occasional mistake. Apparently, Ruth, by God's grace, was able to overlook Naomi's anger. <laughs> when she was angry at God, Ruth was saying, that's not the mother-in-law I know. Are you following that's not what I've seen over the last decade plus. This is not the mother-in-law. This is not Naomi, the one I have watched. This is not the person whose character has been revealed for the last several years. And thank God that's the way he deals with all of us. So if you make a mistake, know God can still work through you. Let's fast forward to finish the story. You know what happened, how Ruth went to go and work, right? And, and what did she say? Ruth said, so Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the fields and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may found favor, find favor. I would like to encourage you to read the whole book back home. This is chapter 2, verse 2. And as you know, some of you know the whole story. He, she went and she ended up working in the field of a man who later on showed up. His name was Boaz. And Boaz looked and said, who is that woman over there? They explained to him. He went and he talked kindly to her. You know how the story continues. And then Ruth goes back with lots of grain. And you know how her mother-in-law gave her good advice. She said, go at night because this is part of our custom. You know, that Boaz can, uh, he should be able to become your new husband. And she appeals to him uh, that early morning. And Boaz is a man of integrity. And Boaz said, no, 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 I'm not the first one in line to get married to you. I have to go and share. I have to tell everybody because I'm not next in line. So, so hold on. I'll go and talk to the elders. And he does. And of course, the man who was next in line, according to the custom of the time, to marry her says, I, I don't want to marry her. You go ahead. <laughs> you know the story. I'm just summarizing very briefly the custom of the time. And of course, fast forward, Boaz marries Ruth. And so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he, when he went into her, notice the language, 
the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. The last chapter, Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. And of course, there is joy now. And, and many times you say, oh, God has blessed Naomi. I mean, God has blessed Ruth and Boaz. Yes, yes. But notice what the women said. Then the women said to Naomi, oh, wait a minute. This is the Naomi who complained about God, right? They said to her, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. They re probably remembered how Naomi had been accusing God, right? Now they're coming and said, God has blessed you, Naomi. You were the one that complained about God. Look how God has blessed you. God has blessed you, all right? And then they continue. They say this, may he be to you, Naomi, a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is, who is better to you than seven sons. Oh, seven is the perfect number. And to have a son was very important. But these women say to Naomi, your daughter-in-law, the one you ignored, the one you didn't mention when you came back, that woman is better to you than not just one son or two sons, but is better to you than what? Seven sons, the perfect number because she has borne him to you. Wow. They are trying to remind Naomi that God has not forgotten her. Naomi had lived a life, even when she, they had done, they'd made a mistake by going to stay with the enemy. She had lived a sufficiently consistent life. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name. The women, the neighbors, they gave him a name, saying, there is born a son to whom? To Naomi. <laughs> they don't say it's to Ruth. <laughs> they are reminding Naomi. <laughs> they are emphasizing, trying to help her, apparently, in her grief. These people have coming to support her. There is born a son to Naomi, and they call his name Obed. Notice the language. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth chapter 4, verse 17. Of course, you can follow the family tree. Ruth, Mary, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. And there's a dotted line that goes all the way down to Jesus. And you can read the rest later on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, and verse 6, and verse 16. Amazingly, by God's grace, because Ruth, listen carefully, Ruth had seen sufficient in the life of Naomi that Ruth chose to join Naomi's people. Ruth chose to join Naomi's God. Ruth, despite Naomi falsely accusing God, Ruth had seen enough in her life. And ultimately, through the line of Ruth comes none other than Jesus himself. As we end today, I want us to reflect. Sadly, Elimelech, that means my God is king. He hadn't lived up to his name. Naomi, which means pleasant, she had not lived up to her name. Okay, They made massive mistakes. Listen carefully. Yet, yet, by God's grace, Naomi's overall witness enabled Ruth to accept God. Isn't that good news? You and I, friends, can do the same. Don't despair if you make mistakes. By God's grace, a continual Christian life will be a witness. Why? Because you see, the Lord is not slack. Read with me, please. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Isn't that good news? Yes. Notice God's desire is to save people. And as we end today, one more Bible verse. I would like to appeal to those of you who are struggling, who've been reflecting over the last four or five messages. By God's grace, we've been putting out an appeal to you. We've been calling upon you to respond to God's grace. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 puts it this way, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I thank God for the story of Ruth. 
I thank God for working through Naomi's life in spite of her massive wrong attack upon God's character. But she had lived a consistent life sufficiently so that Ruth saw God working through her. And Ruth chose. And so today, we're going to invite you to stand and sing number 109, Marvelous Grace, as our choristers come up here and lead us singing this beautiful hymn. We're going to appeal to you. If there's one or more of you, we're going to ask you to come and so. Those who've been responding, we want to invite you to come up first. You've already been coming up. We want to invite those who have already come, please come up to the front and join us as our choristers lead us. So we're going to sing one stanza, Marvelous Grace, and we will invite you to come and join us and any others to come up as well. Those who want to be baptized this Sabbath, join us now as we sing this beautiful hymn, number 109, Marvelous Grace. Our sin and our guilt Yonder on Calvary's mount on port There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon as well as those who want to put their prayer requests. So during our third stanza, please come up and join us. Drop your prayer requests in the prayer box. And please, those who have already made the commitment and have signed up with our pastors and talked with them, come up front as we sing the next stanza uh, with our song leaders, stanza number three. And bring your prayer requests as well so that we can pray for them. Singing. Marvelous, infinite, much less grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive?
to bring your prayer requests up here. And those of you who want to join us for this coming Sabbath, two days time, we will be having a joyous celebration, baptism. We want to invite you to join us. Perhaps you feel like Naomi who have who has made so many mistakes. Some may feel that it is time to make a public recommitment. If you need to be rebaptized, this is your opportunity this coming Sabbath. If you, like Ruth, have never made a public commitment, you want to be baptized, come and join us. You may want to also come and just have Bible studies. Whatever your request, join the pastors. Come and join us up here to make that commitment to Jesus or also bring your prayer requests up to the front as we sing our final stanza. Let's sing one more from 309 together. Stanza two. Sin and despair like the sea waves cause threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold points to the refuge the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, sins is your grace. Thank you, Father, for those who have stepped forward, who've made that important decision to follow Jesus all the way. Thank you for, from the youngest to the oldest, those who have made this commitment. I pray you'll bless as they meet with our pastoral team, as they take time to make this important decision, and as our pastors lead them through this important step. Thank you for the story of Ruth, a young lady who saw enough in the life of Naomi that even though Naomi wrongly accused you, Ruth was still willing to follow, to follow this wonderful God of Israel. May we true, be true to God. May we live a consistent Christian life so that our lives will be living letters known and read by all men. Guide and bless us, Lord, in the rest of this week. In the precious name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.